Okay, welcome English teacher friends. So out of all the short stories that I teach, 9th through 12th grade, AP, even at the college level, Death by Scrabble probably takes the cake. It's a um, fantastic piece for some pretty rich Socratic seminars, Harkness discussions, Plato's Plato's discussions, whatever um, <laughs> discussion format I throw at them. It's one of those short stories that, um, you know, once we begin to read it in class, kids just get hooked to it and um, really devote some attention and some close reading to it. So for this writing workshop, we're going to tackle Death by Scrabble. And for those that are familiar with my work, I'm just going to run through uh, a typical Christian Kuhn-esque writing workshop. So... I'll, uh, I'll demonstrate how to use my templates of the declarative and the inverted thesis to get anchored uh, in the introductory paragraph, and then we'll uh, explore how the syllogistic method can be used to construct the body paragraph. So let's launch right in. So one of the things you've heard me say a thousand times, perhaps, is this idea that you got to Bob Ross your instruction. So in order for templates to work, especially mine, it's really vital that teachers position themselves as the expert writer in the classroom and provide plenty of exemplars and models to their students. So oftentimes uh, when I push into districts and work with departments, you know, I see their being a major discrepancy and a major difference between the assigning of writing and the direct teaching of it. Far too often, you know, I think English teachers think it's fine enough just to give a kid a graphic organizer and say, all right, have at it. You got a couple of blocks to, you know, bang out this essay. And students learn best when we take a Bob Ross approach. And here's what I mean by that. So imagine Bob Ross comes onto the screen and he says something closely akin to this. Hello, happy little people. Today we're going to paint a beautiful New England autumnal landscape with beautiful fall foliage. And in the center of our canvas, we're going to include a New England wood-covered bridge going over a babbling brook. All right. So if you were to, you know, say, all right, here's a graphic organizer on your mark, get set, go. You know, most of us would fumble and falter at that miserably. And that goes for our students as writers. You know, what Bob Ross does is he sits there at his easel with his canvas and his paints and his brushes, and he proceeds to walk us through that painting step by step. And the cool thing about Bob Ross is, and a lot of people don't know this, is he used one heuristic. You know, in, in composition, we tend to call it a template, and it was known as the wet on wet technique. Literally every single painting he ever did, he employed the wet on wet technique. And for uh, my students, when they write, no matter the expository mode, no matter the essay, it's declare, invert, syllogistic every single time. So it's important for me to get at the easel, to get at the canvas and say, all right, guys, I wrote for you three inverted theses, three declarative, choose your poison. You've seen it six times on your mark, get set, go. It really demystifies the writing process when uh, I approach the teaching of writing that way. And uh, I always encourage teachers that I work with to um, be the veritable Bob Ross at composition. So the first question that we need to ask ourselves is this, how do I write the introductory paragraph? And for those of you that are familiar with my work, I hope you say, holy cow, this guy's not lying. This works every single time. You declare or you, you invert. So let's unpack what I mean by this again. So in a declarative thesis, you're gonna begin with the thesis. Literally, first sentence, just boom, drop the thesis as succinctly, concisely, declaratively as possible. Um, in other YouTube videos that I've posted, uh, I've done a lot of work with um, demonstrating for students, and I do this in my classroom and when I work with um, you know, students in other districts. This idea that comes from Strunk and White's Write It Right, that there are 12 different ways to construct a sentence. So you're going to see my students have 
um, good syntactical manipulation, pretty good voice rhythm and flow because they can wield different sentence constructs, oftentimes uh, with young, emerging, struggling writers. And I even see this, you know, looking at AP anchor papers. Students um, oftentimes completely overuse the short, simple declarative sentence. And they might only manipulate like two or three sentence constructs throughout the entirety of their essay. So it's really important that they be able to, uh, um, um, you know, wield a few sentence constructs. You'll also see my students um, have a relatively good academic tone. So I uh, tell them about tier two level vocabulary, which is just your average run of the mill SAT level word. And I run word academies throughout the duration of my academic year. So um, my students tend to really augment their vocab um, exponentially over uh, the academic year. And then the other thing that goes into the introductory paragraph is a little bit of context and background. And because we're dealing with templates and we got some training wields and scaffolds, it's going to be exactly four sentences long, no more, no less, exactly four sentences. So we are performing literary analysis since we are dealing with short stories. So, um, for literary analysis, you're always going to invert the thesis. Otherwise, what happens is um, you're going to, you know, students are most likely going to switch the expository mode. And the demand of the assignment is perform literary analysis. Oftentimes, when you declare, you switch to plot analysis. So, just as a means to avoid them from uh, committing that faux pas, I have them invert. And again, in my videos for literature, uh, you'll see this being the uniform approach. And then for argument, persuasion, and synthesis, it's a coin flip between declaring and inverting. And rhetorical analysis, you always want to declare. So check out those videos if you're, uh, if you're interested to um, get more insight on this. So in the inverted model, you're going to end with the thesis, focus on those sentence constructs, tier two level vocabulary, context and background, and exactly four sentences. So there are two questions I feel that are implicit in every prompt, and this is especially true of uh, FRQ1 and FRQ2 for the lit exam. And uh, uh, for the rhetorical analysis in particular on the Lang exam. But even if we're just doing general ed, you know, 9 through 12 general ed, there are uh, two questions that are implicit in every prompt. And the first is, what is the authorial intent? And the second is, how does the author construct meaning? If the student is to answer both of these questions within the inverted model, they unquestionably will get anchored in a pretty dynamic thesis statement. It's contingent upon how accurate is their read. Did they ascertain the authorial intent uh, correctly and accurately, uh, you know, in terms of um, arriving at the author's thesis. So if they can do, you know, if they can read well and then answer these two questions and, um, you know, just do some nuanced things as far as composition goes, out of the gate they have a very strong foundation. So let's take a look at a couple. So it is not until when a person realizes how easy it is for their mind to be manipulated that they blind themselves to the idea that they are a mere puppet in someone else's game. So that's the whole gist of the story, right? So I tell my students, go cutthroat. What is, what is the authorial intent? You know, why did the author write this piece? What's the purpose? What's the theme? What's the thesis? So you lead with that. What is the authorial intent? And then you're just going to provide some context and background. In this sense, therefore, the mind has a powerful way of attracting things that are in harmony with it, for better or worse. Thoughts are the seeds to reality, but it is presumptuous for man to believe that his thoughts alone can control the operations of the universe. So in this last sentence, we're going to get to how does the author construct meaning. 
And in this, you focus on the most salient literary terms and devices in the piece. So look how we drop those terms and devices to get anchored in the thesis statement. Fish, through situational and verbal irony, arrives at this understanding through his protagonist insistence on playing God. So let's talk about the whole thing. And then as we look at uh, the exemplars that are going to follow this, let's just see how the template is uniformly applied. So you can see here that the vocab is augmented, it's elevated, but the student doesn't sound like a goon. They don't sound pretentious. It doesn't sound contrived. They're definitely in their wheelhouse. But look at the sentence constructs there. You know, some of them are very advanced. So you'll see my students, um, perhaps to a fault, because when I model, um, you know, when I when I write composition, I befriend the hyphen perhaps too much. But you'll see my students um, use that and then. Um, you know, have some parenthetical statements and some adjective clauses, and they really know how to um, manipulate their syntax for voice rhythm and flow. And at this stage of the academic year, they don't even think about it. They're not like, hmm, I need a parenthetical statement right now, you know, to alter my syntax, right? So they just do it. It becomes instinctual and intuitive and kind of habitual. But you can see here, this flow is really nice. It's exactly four sentences long, and it's inverted. The last sentence is the thesis statement. So let's take a look at student two. Totally different student going to follow the exact same template, exact same approach. It has been said that fate leads the willing and drags along the reluctant. But where one goes wrong is in entertaining the idea that life's playbook can be stolen from the hands of God. There's a natural order to the universe, an order that man cannot control, no matter the efforts. Last sentence, do the exact same thing. First three sentences, what is the authorial intent? Last sentence, how does the author construct meaning? Fish's protagonist is an ironic reminder of man's limited self and limited presence on the stage of life. So you end with your terms, you know, your devices. And... Uh, uh, to get anchored in the thesis statement every single time for literary analysis, no matter the genre, no matter the FRQ, uh, this template of the inverted thesis works. So you can always invert for literary analysis. So here's student number three, totally different student, exact same execution of the template. First three sentences, what is the authorial intent? Fourth sentence, how does the author construct meaning? Go for the gusto, so like cutthroat. What is Fish doing thematically, um, you know, in terms of his thesis? Um, you know, answer that question right out of the gate. Where people go wrong is in not knowing the difference between fate and destiny, right? ka -ching. that's Fish's whole point. One's personal destiny can be controlled because life offers choices and the gift of free will. But fate is a one-way street. Clearly, a higher power is calling the shots. Last sentence, look at the terms and devices again. Comically and quite ironically, Fish's protagonist struggles to comprehend the difference between these two concepts. So that's how the introductions go. And... You know, I know some teachers for the um, for the laying in the lit exam uh, really encourage their students just to write the one sentence introduction. And I'm really opposed to that. I um, I talk to my students a lot about first impressions and I just think the one sentence uh, introduction, while it does get a student the thesis point. Just out of the gate, I just don't think it's that showy. I don't think it's that flashy. And in order to get the pizzazz and the wow point, you know, to score up on the rubric, I just think you need a better first impression because I think subjectively, a lot of readers after the introduction situate the kid on the rubric. And I know some readers vehemently protest that when I say that. And I'm like, I just, I, I, I disagree. I, I think one of the things that we intuitively do as readers is very early in the paper say, yeah, this is headed towards a three, right? 
or holy cow, this is like a five, six paper. This is phenomenal. So I don't think we hold our opinion till the end. As we're proceeding through the essay, we situate that kid on the rubric. So I want my kids to make a dazzling splash right out of the gate. So sentence constructs, vocab, you know, the dynamic, the dynamic nature of the thesis. Um, and I think my students, because I get them in early September, all the way till the time of the exam, they practice this four sentence inverted thesis. They can crank these super fast um, come time of the exam, probably quicker than a lot of kids can write the one sentence bagger, um, just because it becomes so instinctual and intuitive after a while. Nothing changes, right? No matter the expository mode, uh, they're doing this. Um, and for the lit exam, it's always you know literary analysis for all three FRQs. So they, um, they tend to be fine going four sentences and uh, that grueling race, that grueling marathon against the clock is just a non-issue except for a couple of my uh, real slow eakers that if they had six hours, literally if they had like three hours to write one essay, they probably couldn't get it done. And I always, I always have a couple of those kids per year. So the next question we ask ourselves is, how do I write the body paragraphs? And again, nothing changes here. So for those of you that are familiar with my work, I hope you like clap your hands and nod your head and say, boo yeah, this guy is not lying to me whatsoever. These templates work every single time. And it totally demystifies the writing process. So if you're doing those nuance academies that I do, um, when I push into districts and work with departments or in my mastermind professional development courses um, or, you know, when I just work with teachers one on one, um, nothing changes. It's it's the same approach every single time. So uh, we don't need to reinvent the wheel every single time, you know, and, you know, quick story as an aside, I uh, was working with um, a department just the other week i pushed into their school and uh was kind of doing an assessment of their curriculum and um their writing program and i was in a senior class general ed senior class and they had finished um one flew over the cuckoo's nest and the teacher um assigned the essay and so many students looked at a blank sheet of paper in their uh their blank chromebook screens as if they had never written an essay before in their lives. And I know a lot of teachers experience that. You're just like, oh my God, you're seniors. You've done this a thousand times. Why are you posturing as if you've never written an essay before? And simple answer is this, we're not Bob Rossing for them. So assigning is very confusing. We have to directly explicitly teach uh, in order for students to understand and I usually tell my students, come March, I'm no longer Bob Ross. I have modeled for you from September till March, and you got to figure it out on your own. And, you know, if something new comes up, I'll model it. But um, come March, they've pretty much seen everything that they're going to see compositionally. So um, I really back off and, and have them uh, figure things out on their own. Um, I figure I find that, that I still need to help them with their reads, um, you know, in order to get to the complexity of their reads. But as far as the writing goes, they're on their own. So the syllogistic method, just to review, comes from the Aristotelian tradition. Aristotle ran a school called the Lyceum, and the young aristocratic boys would go there to learn polemics, oration, the art of debate. And, you know, he would um, throw out these topics in, that you see in some of the texts that come out of this era, like Plato's Republic, where you throw out a big philosophical question like, what is justice? And all, you know, all these philosophical think tankers come to the mic and they offer their definition of what justice is. And one of the things you'll notice in those debates is that uh, the philosophers argue syllogistically. They go premise, premise, conclusion. So it's a heuristic that came from the Aristotelian tradition. 
And ultimately what you're doing when you argue syllogistically is creating very cogent, very logical lines of reasoning that are mathematical in computation. So in the first premise, if I were to say arsenic is deadly, and to follow up with the second premise that says my dog ate arsenic, you're naturally going to conclude that your dog is going to die. So um, when students write, we want them to be this bulletproof and this logical in their writing. You know, it's like saying uh, any 38 year old or older non felon born in the US can run for the presidency. Second premise, James is 42, born in the state of Rhode Island, has no felony records. Conclusion, James can run for the presidency, right? So lockstep, sequential, chronological, don't deviate, uh, nothing extraneous, uh, don't break the promise of the first premise, and you're golden. You have a really good line of reasoning. So the syllogistic method in terms of executing literary analysis looks like this. So the first premise is going to be an argument containing terms and devices, literary terms and devices. And again, for those that are familiar with my work, I always want the first premise to be three sentences long. So for the synthesis exam, or the synthesis paper um, on the Lang exam, the college board always says, your argument must be central. And I don't care what the expository mode is or the task. Um, you know, we're writing argument here. So I want the student's argument to be central. Otherwise, what happens is if they get into uh, their textual support too high up in the body paragraph, again, we're switching expository modes and not meeting the demands of the assignment. And we've switched from performing literary analysis to plot analysis, where it's just going to read like a cliff note summation. So it's really important to set up that argument and get anchored in the terms and devices. The second premise begins in the fourth sentence, and this is where the textual support comes in. So I like to see a nice teeter-totter balance between the quoting and the paraphrasing. And in a second, we'll look at how my students embed their quotes and have uh, silky smooth quote transitions, because as you know, oftentimes those are abrupt. And then the conclusion, and I really want to emphasize this because this gives teachers some confusion. I'm talking the conclusion of the syllogistic body paragraph, not the conclusion paragraph of the essay. This is where the textual analysis comes. And I tell my students that the first premise is a promise. So you got to kind of shake hands back to that first premise and echo the thesis so that in a sense you come full circle, right? If you start with arsenic, you gotta end with arsenic, right? And uh, keep it all tied together. So smart students say, Mr. Kuhn, we're using templates. So we know that the introductory paragraph is four sentences long, no more, no less. You must have a magic number for syllogistic body paragraphs. And I do. So oftentimes when we read student work, there's just not enough textual support or analysis. And what they do is write these itty bitty four to five, six sentence body paragraphs that just don't advance the argument enough. So I tell my students to shoot for 10 sentences, hard cap at 12, because if they go over 12, the tendency is again, that they're going to get into plot, they're gonna bloviate, they're gonna go wayward, and um, really have a lot of distractor information, and most likely break their line of reasoning. So 10 tends to keep them focused so that they have enough support and analysis um, and also uh, enough space to fully develop that line of reasoning. So here is one. And again, look at the first premise. I've identified it here. It's going to be three sentences long. Get anchored in the argument using terms and devices. So look what the student does here. There's a couple of tactic, tact, tactical maneuvers that my students will make. And again, those of you that are familiar with my work, you'll be like, yeah, this guy never changes the template. So I like it when my students proceed chronologically and sequentially. So I say, start where fish starts. Start exactly where the short story starts and move your way methodically through it. 
and weave your analysis when needed, right? So just cross analysis when cross analyze when needed. So you'll see my students transition this way often, right from the onset, right? So you cue your reader that you have a chronological sequence and that you're establishing your line of reasoning. So right from the onset, Fish presents the mind over matter conundrum both through situational and verbal irony, so there are your terms, his protagonist comes to a slow understanding that he's not endowed with the power to play God and therefore control fate. Man is a limited creature, but for some, this realization is slow in coming. So the same concepts apply. We want to hear that academic tone, again, without sounding contrived and pretentious, and we want to see the sentence constructs for voice, rhythm, and flow. So that's what this student has done, and they've captured this argument in exactly three sentences. So the argument is central, and one of the things I do with my students during writing conferences, either one-on-one -on -one or a whole class. Like if I'm doing a whole class uh, writing workshop and we're just analyzing this student's piece, I would say, all right, the first premise is a promise. In your own words, what is this student promising? So we gotta take a look at the situational and verbal irony and then take a look at this, um, concept of playing God, you know, like fate, destiny, um, preordination, you know, concepts like that. So all of the textual support, the quoting and paraphrasing must be germane to that promise. So again, keep it anchored in the line of reasoning. So we said right from the onset. So our quote, our paraphrase should come from up top the short story. And that's what this student does. Immediately, the protagonist establishes himself with an emphatic sense of godlike authority in announcing that it's a hot day and I hate my wife. So you see there in the fourth sentence, I like my students to get right into the text. So paraphrase or quote, uh, most of my students will quote. So you quote, you got to analyze it, you got to paraphrase it, build, build, build. The two sentiments do not naturally align, but it does not matter. These are the facts. The line structuring is emphatic as the protagonist's deliberation of thought and that the reader is told that we're playing Scrabble. That's how bad it is, right? So you can get into some syntactical maneuvers uh, as well because the syntax um, adds to the ironic elements of the story. So you can bring in other things for full analysis and full reads because we know that um, on FRQ 2 in particular and 1 uh, it's really nice for the students to do a syntactical read. So look at the transition here. Tie it all together. Keep the line of reasoning intact. An unspoken irony is that while the husband tries to seize power from God he plays the part of the victim who's being controlled by the trappings of a lousy marriage. He creates a stark dichotomy in that he hates her. If she wasn't around, he'd be doing something interesting right now. So you can see here, um, this student is taking from the text pretty liberally without overdoing it. You don't want to overquote, right? And you don't want quote dumps. So I have a little template device that I equip my students with, and I call it the five word rule. If a student is going to have silky smooth quote transitions, typically if you place a minimum of five, so not exactly, but a minimum of five words in front of the quote and keep the quote small, it should sound conversational and be pretty smooth. And uh, you can see so far as my student is quoting here, that rule seems to be working. So again, quote, analyze, paraphrase, tie it all together. The husband has seemingly forgotten the fact that he is in control, yet he broods and entertains the singular idea that his wife's insuff insufferable presence is the one thing preventing him from living a much fuller life. So you can see that teeter-totter balance of quoting and paraphrasing. His sole focus is to see her to her death. Ironically, the Scrabble letters become the head nod of God. 
the reader is told that if only I had a D, then I could play murder. Right. So we're still going here. We got to go on to the next slide. Uh, I'm out of room here. So we're going to, you know, see where this leads to. That would be a sign. So again, know all these sentence constructs here, the variation, the voice, the rhythm, the flow, this nice, you know, um, academic tone, a little bit of vernacular in it to keep it hip and spunky. That would be permission. Uh, that would be permission. Strangely, the protagonist is looking outside of himself for validation and resolve. He's divorced from calling the shots of his destiny and has in turn left chance to a few wooden letter pegs. Life with this woman is insufferable and he wants out. But instead of simply getting up and leaving, he plays zaps with the Z double and she gets a static shock off the air conditioning unit. As odd as it may sound, this is taken as a sign that God is granting him permission to exact some sort of nefarious scheme. So that's a lot of support and analysis. And again, we don't want to go over 12 sentences. Like we could go, you know, go on and on. There's so much in this with, um, you know, the, the Scrabble offerings and spellings that uh, we don't need to do all of them, just a few and uh, go for the essential ones. But let's go back to the first premise. Have we sustained our line of reasoning? Yeah, we have. So like none of the quotes are outside of that promise. Everything's germane, everything's anchored, all the paraphrasing and quoting is aligned to that first premise. So now we're at the conclusion. So you gotta go back to the first premise and you gotta echo the thesis. Real quick, just a couple of sentences, right? Tie it up, link it all back, you know, fully draw the line of reasoning. Fish has fate, destiny, God's will, free will, and predetermination on a wild collision course. There is only so much man is capable of controlling. But ironically, what one can control, they often concede by the end of the game. So that is perfect, right? That's that's some perfect, cogent, logical, clearly articulated writing. And, you know, there aren't many snafus in there. It's pretty clean writing. And, um, you know, if a student is able to do this on the lit exam, uh, they're 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 going to crush it. Right. This is this is going to be a high scoring paper. And the template is what produces this. And then running the kid through, you know, my word academies, my nuance academies, you know, all the strunk and white stuff that I that I do with them. And, I, and again, I have YouTube videos on that. So subscribe and, uh, you know, stay abreast of those postings if you want uh, the full uh, vision and scope on, on how, uh, you know, my academic year is structured for these students. So that takes us to the end and uh, I'll wrap up quickly. So I am working with perfection learning and on a monthly basis, I'm doing free webinars with them. Uh, I got waylaid by COVID pneumonia and uh, just was out of commission for uh, February and uh, I had to skip March, but uh, I'll be back in action soon enough and I'll be doing um, in uh, April, a uh, webinar on my alternative grading methods, and then we'll get into some of my other um, aspects as well as the academic year progresses. Uh, I got an iron in the fire with the National Writing Project, so I'll keep the group posted with regards to that, and that's all free. And then uh, I think I've mentioned this a couple of times, but uh, really haven't... Uh, um, advertised it too much because we're still in the midst of getting this project done. Tim Freitas uh, of Garden of English fame, he's more um, present on the AP language site than the, uh, than the lit site, although he, he, he does bounce up on there every now and then. Uh, we are collaborating on a textbook together and we're slowly building that and uh, cranking it out. We're knee deep in the process 
and uh, between all of our little side projects, we're not sure when we will have that finished, uh, hopefully sooner than later, um, but we'll keep the groups posted of that. So I'm in the data collection phase of uh, my writing process. And as a result, I've created a course called the Teach It Right Five Week Mastermind. And what I'm doing is just taking, you know, five, six, seven um, teachers that are looking to revamp, recalibrate, kind of fine tune how they teach composition. And I'm equipping them over a five week period with uh, my templates, my alternative grading methods, and my Plato Plato discussion modality um, for classroom discussion. And what we're doing is I'm overlooking their shoulders. I'm, you know, working with their students a little bit, really working closely with the teacher, and we're reporting back to each other uh, often and just seeing how it goes. And I'm going to use some of those discussions and findings in the textbook um, just for anecdotal um, evidence and information. So in brief, what we're doing is we're meeting uh, for five consecutive Sundays uh, starting at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And um, it's just an hour, but we, we, we tend to go over a little bit. There's uh, follow-up questions and then just some chit-chat about how things are going. And uh, um, I'm offering this uh, just a few times. So, um, you know, check in to see when the next offering is if you're interested. You can email me at teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com. I have that at the bottom of the screen. And then I also have a web page uh, that has some uh, more information on it, teachinghowtowrite.com. But reach out if that sounds intriguing to you and you'd like to join us. Uh, I'm finishing one up um, next week and uh, we'll launch another one in a couple of weeks um, after I get a breather and compile the information from the, uh, the first mastermind. So that's it. Those are my irons in the fire. And uh, hopefully you found this writing workshop to be useful and can uh, incorporate it into your instruction. So for now, be well, happy teaching, happy writing, and I'll be posting some more short stories, some more classic ones uh, in the coming days and weeks. Take care for now.